part two. We are on page 115, All About Love, Bell Hooks. Page 115. When greedy consumption is the order of the day, dehumanization becomes acceptable, then treating people like objects is not only acceptable, but is required behavior. It's the culture of exchange, the tyranny of marketplace values. Those values inform attitudes about love. Cynicism about love leads young adults to believe there is no love to be found and that relationships are needed only to the extent that they satisfy desires. That's interesting. In what ways are folks cynicists they're, they're they don't believe in love like in what ways are we become when we when do we become cynical right when do we become cynical about love that there's no love to be found that we will never find a mate that we will never be in a healthy relationship like yeah and that the only relationships worth a damn are the ones that the ones that satisfy our desires. How many times do we hear someone say, well, if that person is not satisfying your needs, you should get rid of them. Relationships are treated like Dixie cups. They are the same. They are disposable. If it does not work, drop it, throw it away, get another. Committed bonds, including marriage, cannot last when this is the prevailing logic. Committed bonds. There's a word. Committed bonds. What? That's, that's the definition that we need to be looking at. What is a committed bond? Cannot last when this is the prevailing logic. And friendships are loving community or, and friendships or loving community cannot be valued and sustained. Most of us are unclear about what to do to protect and strengthen caring bonds and our self-centered needs when our self-centered needs are not being met. Most people wish they could find love where they are, in the lives and relationships they have chosen, but they feel they, they lack useful strategies for maintaining these bonds. They turn to mass media for answers. Increasingly, the mass media is the primary vehicle for the promotion and affirmation of greed. There is little information offered about the establishment and maintenance, maintenance of meaningful relationships. There is little information offered about how to establish meaningful relationships or how to maintain them. Some of us haven't been modeled that. We didn't learn that. If the will to accumulate is not already present in the television watcher or the moviegoer, it will be implanted by images that bombard the psyche with the message that consuming with others, not connection, should be our goal. Damn. Consuming with others rather than connecting is the goal. Nowadays, we go to a movie and must watch commercials first. The relaxed, receptive state of surrender we like to reserve for the pleasure of entering into the aesthetic space of a film in a dark theater is now given over to advertising, where our sense and our sensibilities are assaulted against our will. Greed is rightly considered a deadly sin because it erodes the moral values that encourage us to care for the common good Greed violates the spirit of connectedness and community that is natural to human survival. It wipes out individual recognition of the needs and concerns of everyone, replacing this awareness with harmful self-centeredness. Healthy narcissism 
the self-acceptance, self-worth that is the cornerstone of self-love is replaced by a pathological narcissism wherein only the self matters. That justifies any action that enables the satisfying of desires. The will to sacrifice on behalf of another, always present when there is love, is annihilated by greed. No doubt this explains our nation's willingness to deprive poor citizens of government-funded social services while huge sums of money fuel the ever-growing culture of violent imperialism. The profiteering profits of greed are never content. It is not enough for this country to be consumed by a politics of greed. It must become the natural way of life globally. Generosity and charity militates against the proliferation of greed, whether it takes the form of kindness to one's neighbor, creating a progressive system of job sharing or supporting state-funded welfare programs. When the politics of greed become a cultural norm, all acts of charity are wrongly seen as suspect and are represented as a gesture of the weak. As a consequence, our nation's citizens become less charitable every day arrogantly defending self-preserving policies which protect the interests of the rich by claiming that the poor and needy have not worked hard enough. I have been astonished by hearing individuals who inherited wealth in childhood warn against sharing resources because people needing help should work for money in order to appreciate its value. Inherited wealth and or substantial material resources are rarely talked about in the mass media because those who receive it do not wish to validate the idea that money received that is not a reward for hard work is beneficial. Their acceptance and use of this money to strengthen their economic self-sufficiency exposes the reality that working hard is rarely the means by which enough of us can gain enough access to material resources to become wealthy. One of the ironies of the culture of greed is that the people who profit the most from earnings they have not worked to attain are the most eager to insist that the poor and working classes can only value material resources attained through hard work. Of course, they are merely establishing a belief system that protects their class interests and lessens their accountability to those who are without privilege. Marianne Williamson addresses the widespread cynicism about the sharing of resources which threatens the spiritual well-being of our nation in the healing of America. Williamson contends, there is so much injustice in America and such a conspiracy not to discuss it and so much suffering and so much deflection lest we notice. We are told that these problems are secondary or that it would cost too much to fix them as though money is what matters most. Greed is considered legitimate now while brotherly love is not. Although Williamson is a new age guru, her courageous willingness to talk about the unacceptable did not diminish her popularity. Most readers simply chose to overlook this particular book. In it, she challenges us to resist to dare to change injustice. Without denying that she is privileged, she calls herself and us to task, to the, to task for not sharing the wealth. Ooh, she is not playing with this chapter. Let's breathe. How we feeling? Cause shit, that's a lot, yo. The haves and have nots. The haves telling us that we need to work hard so that we can reach their level, so we can have what they have when most of them have inherited that wealth and didn't have to work a day of their lives. It was just handed, passed down. But we, you cut our resources, keep us in debt, give us credit cards so we cannot get out of debt, dig ourselves into deeper and deeper holes. Exactly. 
They never worked hard. You know who I love? Anderson Cooper. CNN's Anderson Cooper. Anderson Cooper is brilliant. Anderson Cooper's mother was Gloria Vanderbilt of the Vanderbilts. Um, I love, um, what is it called? What was that era called? The gold something. Does someone know that history? I wish Courtney was awake. It's a, uh, I can't think of it. But when you think about, what was the movie? Um, definitely took our land. Talk about it. They definitely took our land. But what I wanted to say about Gloria Vanderbilt is that while we're talking about those who, their summer homes were the mansions in Newport mansions in like Martha's Vineyard and Black Island. Like when we took when I'm talking I'm talking about the richest families of the United States of America, right? So we're talking about Carnegie's, Rockefellers, right? Um is it the golden age? I don't know. It's something, something. But these are like the richest motherfuckers in the in the, the country, right? These families. They were like five. And Gloria Vanderbilt inherited right her mother's her mother's riches Alma I know the story well because we I love that history so much and one day I'm gonna write a book about that from you know a woman of color like perspective um a queer woman of color perspective <laughs> switch it up yo um Gloria Vanderbilt told her son that she would that he would not be inheriting their money, that he would have to work for all his shit his entire life, and he has. He's privileged, obviously. He's still, this is still his family. He's very well off. But the fact that she could have made his life easy, you know, is the is the story. Gilded Age, thank you. Yes, Monet. Monet Magnolia, good looking at the Gilded Age. Oh my God. I love me a Gilded Age. What was the movie that Leo, Leonardo DiCaprio was in? It was very much inspired. What was the movie he was in? Great Gatsby. Yes. Gilded Age, that's the era. Yes. Let's talk about greed, yo. Whew. Everyone finds it difficult to resist the dictates of greed. Letting go of material desires may compel us to enter the space where our emotional wants are exposed. When I interviewed popular rap artist Little Kim, I want to read that. I found it fascinating that she had no interest in love. While she spoke about the lack of love in her life, the topic that most galvanized her attention was making money. I came away from our discussion awed by the reality that a young black female from a broken home with a less than high school education could struggle against all manner of barriers and accumulate material riches yet be without hope that she could overcome the barriers blocking her from knowing how to give and receive love. Damn. I need to read that interview. The culture of greed validates and legitimizes her worship of money. It is not at all interested in her emotional growth. The culture of greed validates and legitimizes her worship of money. Pick any present day person. It is not interested in her emotional growth. Who is interested in Cardi B's growth right now? Who gives a fuck? Who is giving a fuck about how she parents, about her mental health, about her spiritual wellness? Who? Think about it. Who cares if she ever knows love? Sadly, like so many Americans, she believes that the pursuit 
and attainment of wealth will compensate for all emotional lack. Like so many of our nation's citizens, she does not pay close attention to the mass media messages that tells us about the emotional suffering of the rich. If money really made up for losses and lovelessness, the wealthy would be the most blissful people on the planet. Instead, we would do well to remember, again, the prophetic lyrics sung by the Beatles, Money Can't Buy Me Love. Ironically, the rich who grow greedier and overprotective of their wealth are increasingly as perpetually stressed and dissatisfied as the greedy poor who suffer endless cravings. The, the rich cannot get enough. They cannot find contentment. Yet everyone wants to emulate the rich. In Freedom of Simplicity, Richard Foster writes, Think of the misery that comes into our lives by our restless gnawing greed. We plunge ourselves into enormous debt and then take two or three jobs to stay afloat. We uproot our families with unnecessary moves just so we can have a more prestigious house. We grasp and grab and never have enough. And most destructive of all, our flashy cars and sports Sports spectaculars and backyard pools have a way of crowding out much interest in civil rights or inner city poverty or the starved mass of India. Greed has a way of severing the cords of compassion. Indeed, we ignore the starving masses in this society, the 38 million poor, the 38 million Poor people who live are testimony to our nation's failure to share resources in a charitable and equitable manner. The worship of money leads to a hardening of the heart and it can lead any of us to condone either actively or passively the exploitation and dehumanization. What time is it? and dehumanization of ourselves and others because I have a live at 9.30. What time is it? I'm over here thinking like, I don't have a live. Grand Rising, what time is it? It is, okay. All right, we're gonna finish here at nine. Hopefully we finish this chapter. We have one, two, three, let's go. The worship of money leads to a hardening of the heart and it can lead us to condone either actively or passively the exploitation and dehumanization of ourselves and others. Much has been made of the fact that so many 60s radicals went on to become hardcore capitalists profiting by the system they once critiqued and wanted to destroy but no one assumes responsibility for the shift in values that made the peace and love culture turn toward the politics of profit and power. That shift came about because the free love that flourished in the utopian communal hippie and enclaves where everyone was young and carefree did not take root in the daily lives of ordinary working and retired people. Young progressives committed to social justice who had found it easy to maintain radical politics when they were living on the edge on the outside did not want to do the hard work of changing and reorganizing our existing systems in ways that would affirm the values of peace and love or democracy and justice. They fell into despair and that despair made capitulation to the existing social order, the only place of comfort. It did not take long for this generation to find out that they loved material comfort more than justice. It was one thing to spend a few years doing without comfort to fight for justice, for civil rights, for non-white people and women of all races, but it was quite another to consider a lifetime where one might face material lack or be compelled to share resources. When many of the radicals and or hippies who had rebelled against excess privilege began to raise children, they wanted them to have the same access to material privilege they had known, as well as the luxury of rebelling against it. And they wanted them to be materially secure. Concurrently, many of the radicals and or hippies who had come from 
backgrounds of material lack were also eager to find a world of material plenty that would sustain them. Everyone feared that if they continued to support a vision of communalism, of sharing resources, that they would have to make do with less. They would have to make do with less. Nobody's trying to make do with less. Who's trying to share resources? Mine, 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 it's mine. Lately, I have sat around dinner tables with fancy food and drink dismayed as I listened to reformed radicals joke about the fact that they would never have imagined years ago that they would become social liberals and fiscal conservatives. People who want to end welfare while promoting and supporting big business. Mm. How does that work? How do you, how are you a social liberal and a fiscal conservative? How? How do you reconcile that? That makes no kind of sense. You want to have being bold. Black lives matter. But I'm still fucking with Trump. Fuck out of here. Williamson makes this insightful point. The backlash against welfare in America today is not really a backlash against welfare abuse so much as it is a backlash against compassion in the public sphere. While America is full of those who would police our private morals, there is far too little questioning of societal morals. We are among the richest nation on earth, yet we spend a trivial amount on our poor compared to that spent by every other Western industrialized nation. You heard? Trash. This country is trash! One fifth of America. You know. They're like, Alicia, stop saying what you really mean. One fifth of America's children live in poverty. Half of our African American children live in poverty. We are the only industrialized Western nation that does not have universal health care. These are the truths no one wants to face. Many of our nation's citizens are afraid to embrace an ethics of compassion, ethics of love, ethics of bell hooks. Many of our nation's citizens are afraid to embrace an ethics of compassion because it threatens their security. Brainwashed to believe that they can only be secure if they have more than the next person. They accumulate and accumulate and hoard and keep and still feel insecure because there is always someone who has accumulated more. Wow. We are all witnessing the ever widening gap between the rich and poor between the haves and the have-nots. Those with class privilege live in neighborhoods where affluence and abundance are made explicit and are celebrated. The hidden costs of that affluence is not apparent, however. We need not witness the suffering of the many so that the few may live in a world of excessive luxury. I once asked a rich man who had only recently attained his status what he liked most about his new wealth. He said that he liked seeing what money could make people do, how it could make them shift and violate their values. I want to say that again. I once asked a rich man who had only recently attained his status what he liked most about his new wealth. He said that, what he, that he liked seeing what money could make people do, how it could make them shift and violate their values. He personified the culture of greed. His pleasure in being wealthy was grounded in the desire to not only have more than others, but to use that power to degrade and humiliate them. To maintain and satisfy greed, one must support domination. There it is. There it is. There's the fucking truth. There's the fucking truth. And the, and, a, and the world of domination is always a world without love, period. We are all vulnerable. 
We have all been tempted, even those of us committed to an ethic of love are sometimes tempted by greedy desires. Absolutely. These are dangerous times. It is not just the corrupt who fall sway to greed. Individuals with good intentions and kind hearts can be swept away by unprecedented access to power and privilege. When our president exploits his power and consensually seduces a young woman in the government's employ, he gives public expression to his greed, to this greed. His actions reveal a willingness to place all he holds dear at risk for the satisfaction of hedonistic pleasure that so many of our nation's citizens felt. His misuse of power, we're talking about Clinton here, his misuse of power was simply the way things are done, that he simply had the misfortune to get caught, but also it could be any president, right? It is further testimony that the politics of greed are condoned. The politics of greed are condoned. That's anyone. That's anyone with power. Not just white people, black people, Latinos, every fucking body who has money and they get away with all kinds of fucking shit. They exemplify the greedy mindset that threatens to consume our capacity to love and with it our capacity to sacrifice on behalf of those we love. Concurrently, the young woman involved manipulates facts and details and ultimately prostitutes herself by selling her story for material gain because she is greedy for fame and money and society condones this get-rich-quick scheme. Monica Lewinsky. Her greed is even more intense because she also wants to be seen as a victim. With the boldness of any con artist working the capitalist addiction to fantasy, she attempts to rewrite the script of their consensual exchange of pleasure so that it can appear to be a love story. Damn, Belle, you said that. Her hope is that everyone will be seduced by the fantasy and will ignore the reality that deceit, betrayal, and a lack of care for the feelings of others can never be a place where love will flourish. This is not a love story. It is a public dramatization of the politics of greed at play, a greed so intense it destroys love. Greed subsumes love and compassion. Living simply makes room for them. Living simply is the primary way everyone can resist greed every day all over the world. People are becoming more aware of the importance of living simply and sharing resources while, consume, co commu com while communism has suffered political defeat globally. The politics of communalism continue to matter. We can all resist the temptation of greed. We can work to change public policy, electing leaders who are honest and progressive. We can turn off the television set. We can show respect for love. To save our planet, we can stop thoughtless waste. Thoughtless waste. We can recycle and support ecologically advanced survival strategies. We can celebrate and honor communalism and interdependency by sharing resources, please. I believe in that. I believe in that. All these gestures, all these gestures show a respect and a gratitude for life. When we value the delaying of gratification and take responsibility for our actions, we simplify our emotional universe. Living simply makes loving simple. The choice to live simply necessarily enhances our capacity to love. Mm. It is the way we learn to practice compassion, daily affirming our connection to a world community. Damn, that part. The choice to live simply. Woo! And that is how we end chapter seven. Tomorrow we start chapter eight, community loving communism and it is 858 that was a mouthful we can stop loveless waste yes and what is loveless waste someone tell us in the comments what is loveless waste mm. I gotta make my way back 
and pretend um, pretend to um, get ready for my best friend for our date for our IG live let's go let's go let's go loveless waste yo wow Yo, the iPhone, straight up, straight up. I'm not gonna lie, I was just, I keep getting these ads for the iPhone 12. <clears throat> and I have an iPhone 8. There's nothing wrong with my iPhone. There is nothing wrong with my iPhone. Where am I, am I going this way? There is nothing wrong with my iPhone. My iPhone works. It has no cracks. But the iPhone 12 is out. And it's like having the newest, the latest. that waste contributes to environmental pollution, yep. of compassion and sharing resources and this idea of communalism like like that I that real idea of I mean, she really she, she really did an amazing job at um, the layout of this book and how she introduces each chapter each each theme each subject um, because she's moving us into 
this love for community and what that love that love of community really looks like you know what it's really grounded in I I need for someone to leave so that I can park and so that's what I need I need for someone to go to work oh what does that say Tuesday to Friday even down to buying conventional drugstore meds instead of using herbs, natural products, when you go to the bathroom that moves into your waist and affects the wildlife in the ocean. Yep. The constant ads that we need. So, so Courtney and I were watching this, this series called Nosferatu. It's about Christmas land. This shit is creepy. Creepy as fuck. Um, but we were watching it on AMC and they have these ads constantly. Like non-stop. Non-stop ads. And I got to a point where I started muting it. I'm just like, I don't want to even hear the ads. I'm just going to mute it because why are you trying to get in my fucking mental space? Like, that's the waste that we're protecting ourselves from. Who's always alone? I don't know who you are. You're saying prima, but tell me, tell me the name. Parking gods to to work with me. Ay, ay, ay. Me duele mi espalda. Hi. Hi, mi amor. <laughs> word tell them that I said hi and that I love them all right family that was a lot that was a lot to process I'm sending you all crazy crazy love have a beautiful day Ache, amen namaste and so it is I'll check you some of y'all for the for the live Bye. word Gotta make my way there, Monet. Gotta make my way there. Have a beautiful day, everyone. Peace.